And we are live. Uh, so excited. My next guest was born in Los Angeles, California. Her parents are Kevin Stafford and Pamela McGee. She attended Windward High, a private high school in Los Angeles, before leaving California for college. She had many scholarship offers, but she ultimately chose the University of Texas at Austin for a full basketball scholarship. In 2016, she was drafted 10th overall to the Chicago Sky of the W. NBA and currently plays for the Dallas Wings. Sports Lovelace. Welcome, my money, McGee Stafford, to Chicks in the Sports Quarantine Edition. Hi, money. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I am so excited to talk to you. The last time I spoke to you, I remember we were in the gym of Georgia State and you were eating your sandwich for protein. That was so long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm known for snacks. Like, that's my thing. Everybody knows, like, Imani has three or four snacks, like, at all times. Like, I pack my little snack bag like a child everywhere I go. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with snacks. I love snacks. I love snacks. Now, I want to say how you've been doing what you, in this new normal of this pandemic, but we are right now in a very different time, um, protesting everywhere. You are in the A. Can you talk about your mood and just, you know, Let's just chop it up. Let's, you know. <laughs> um, I think I'm tired. Uh, I think it started, uh, like, obviously, before all of the protests started. Um, I was on live, and, and a white guy um, asked me, like, what do you think about George Floyd? Do you have any thoughts about it? You know, and I remember I, I, I actually started crying in the conversation. And I was just like, you know, like, you don't have the right to ask me that because this isn't a conversation I get to exit. I have this conversation every day because it's something I live. People of color. Black people, especially, we live this life every day, right? Like if you're another race, especially if you're a white person, especially a white male, you don't have to talk about this, right? You can use this as a thing piece or something, you know, to something to think about, let's have a conversation, but it's not something you can actively ignore as well, which is what the majority generally does. So I was just like, you don't, you don't get to have this conversation with me because I have to have it every day. Um, every day. And I'm tired, I guess, like I'm exhausted. Um, I'm sad. Uh, it's just sad, right? Like, I'm just hoping that now that we have the majority's attention, we can find a way to mobilize and act actively make change. Um, because we've been here before, right? We did this in 2016, we did this in 2012. So, you know, it, it's a, either we're gonna change hearts and we've been trying to do that. Like, I, I don't share videos of people being murdered. I don't, I don't share, like, I didn't share the Ahmad video. I, I don't wanna watch that personally. Um, and I think it's traumatizing to continually see it. Um, so I, I don't share those videos. I ask that people don't share them for me. Um, and I, I just kind of feel like we're appealing to people that, that have proven they don't care about us. They see our black bodies, they click it, they share it, but they don't care enough to act, actively call for change or actively prosecute. Like how many videos have we seen and, and the officer isn't prosecuted? He's on pay leave. So I, I don't believe that, that that tactic has worked. I understand it's necessary, but personally, I'm like, we keep trying to get people to care about, care. they don't care about us. And they have continually proven that. All, all of middle America that showed up and voted for Trump in 2016 has continually tried very hard to prove that they do not care about us. At it's, all. It's up to us to figure out how do we circumvent that? How, how do we get into places of power? Like that's one of the reasons I want to go to law school because it's not people that look like us that care about us in those positions. I agree. It's a tough place to be in um, sports wise. Uh, I always try to avoid talking politics because again, that divides everyone. Um, everybody has their particular views. You know, it's like, no one's <laughs> you know? we got to talk about it. We got it. And it's right here, right now. I have no choice as a mom, as an African American woman with sons. Um, yeah. It is a very horrible, difficult time right now. It makes me sick to think about it, but I know ultimately there will be a change. I don't know when, but I, I know right now we are getting attention. Trump, you know, everybody in the administration, I just, you know, <laughs> try to tune out and not, because again, we're, we're still in a pandemic for goodness sakes. <laughs> I mean, we're still in a pandemic. So it's a lot that's happening right now. Um, best thing I could say, vote. Get out yeah. and vote. That's and all we can do. Because I'm not a protester, right? You're not going to see me in the streets. Um, and I, I don't disagree with it. Burn all that shit to the ground. That's, that's mm -hmm. my... 
Don't touch small businesses. Don't touch black owned businesses. Bottom corporations, right into the ground. They got enough money. Even downtown. The CNS, the CNN thing was repainted the next day. It was repainted easily, quickly. Exactly. They're good. All them people. Yes. Was, fine. I'm cool with that. I don't, that's not, but I'm not going to be protesting one just because I'm 6'7. I'm the easy target. <laughs> I, I'm not doing it. That's not my method of action, but that doesn't mean that I can't share my voice on the platforms that I have and I can't point people in the right direction. You know, like donate. If you can't donate, raise awareness for the organizations that are doing these things. Talk to these conversations. Like I tell all my white friends, I don't have that many, but the ones that I do. Yes. I, you know, like have this conversation in rooms I can't. It doesn't matter that you talk to me. I know this existence. I live this existence. So you have to go into rooms that I can't. You have to talk to your white family members. You have to talk to your racist cousin. You got to talk to your racist grandparent. And you have to have these conversations that are uncomfortable, but they're far less uncomfortable for you than they are for me. I get it. I get it. And that's true. Um, let's just talk quickly about the WNBA, um, CBA. There's a lot of changes at this yeah, point on exciting, how you feel about that. Man, I'm so proud of us. Um, so one thing for me is that like, we're not anywhere near where we want to be for sure, but we're making moves in the right steps in the right direction. And I think um, obviously having our big brother in the NBA around us makes it look like our progress is like snail speed. Um, but we're, very much so ahead of the NBA when they were at 22, 23. Um, and so our new CBA, not only does it allow people that don't want to go overseas to stay overseas, stay home with the opportunity to make a, a, almost half a million dollars stateside, which has never been a pop possibility in the WNBA, our, everybody's salary doubled. Um, it's rookies making more than me, man. <laughs> like, they don't even know the struggle. Like, rookies getting drafted, like, making third year. Sadly, I'm like, yo, y'all don't even know how we was out here living. Like, but right. it's a beautiful thing to see, like, and it's exciting to see that we all came together and made that thing. And I think the one thing that we've been asking for as players is investment. We're constantly told, like, I always say, it's like when you buy a pack of scissors, you need scissors to open the pack of scissors. <laughs> because you always hear people talking about the WBA, like, nobody wants to watch it. No one comes to the games. Well, no one can find the games. Like, you got to be going a whole scavenger hunt to, like, watch it on television. We show up on our freaking playoffs are on ESPN three. Like, like, you know, like it's hard to escape the NBA, right? I don't, I, I, I'm sure that there are people that love basketball enough to watch 90 games before playoffs. But in reality, everybody's a casual fan. They love the LeBron's from Ohio. They love Riley Curry. They love knowing that JaVale McGee's from Flint. Like, and this, those stories that drive viewership and we don't have those stories being told about us. We don't have the same media attention. We don't have the same effort by the media to give us that opportunity. So like we finally have the WNBA matching what they say with investment. Now every team has a marketing budget that they have to use. They can't just say, oh, we didn't want to spend the money. No, you have to spend that money and you have to do that. So if in, when this, when you can, we opt out year six, I believe is the year we can opt out of this or the league can opt out. And if we get to that point and they're like, yo, we tried it. We gave y'all the money, we gave y'all the attention, we gave y'all the exposure and it didn't work. Then we could be like, bro, this just ain't it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But we never had that experiment. We never had the intention matched match with investment. And that's what this new CBA does. Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I am so super excited. Um, when the season starts, when is a big question. But at this point, <laughs> I know when you have decided to take some time off. Yeah. Let's talk about that and let's talk about how exciting and what you're doing and why you decide to take some time off. Definitely a God thing for sure. Uh, that was not my plan at all. Um, I started looking into law school uh, 2018. I did a Harvard crossover in the business program. It's a program with Harvard Business School and Anita, Anita Elbers, who was like one of the most famous Harvard Business School professors. She's really cool. Follow her on Instagram. She's literally like everyone's favorite professor. Um, but they partner with all the players associations from NFL to NBA to ballet to UFC. Um, it's a little bit of everybody in it. And we basically get to kind of audit a business course for a semester and like have that experience. And for like, you know, the NBA players and baller ballerinas that have been doing this since 16, they've never even been in a college classroom. So it was a really cool experience. And being back in the classroom kind of made me feel like, man, I think I want to go back to school. Like, I think I want to, you know, look into opportunities for that. Um, and then fast forward to when Brett Kavanaugh got confirmed into the Supreme Court justice, I was like, this nation don't care about women. <laughs> and like, I think I knew that and playing in the WBA is something I, I actively experienced, but 
seeing it in that grand of scheme and I don't I you know like obviously I don't know he wasn't convicted I don't know if he actually did rape Dr. Ford but to me being accused is too much like you know what I mean um and for you and I mean it's not enough for you to lose everything but I feel like it's it's enough for you not to be confirmed as to the highest power of the land oh my gosh I get it I definitely get it you taking that time out, I commend you. Um, again, the WNBA is so open to let you guys do, you know, how your dream, how important is that for them to, first, you know what, let me take this back because I, I'm very, very, very proud of the WNBA. Um, out of all the least, I may be misquoting this, but if I'm not mistaken, they were like the very first ones out of all the least to kind of throw up the- Minnesota. Yes, you know, and that right there speaks volume. And of course, then, you know, uh, NBA, um, NHL, <laughs> and, you know, NFL, everybody came behind them with, you know, we stand in support of what's going on with our climate right now with, you know, everything with protesting, you know, enough is enough. Um, the WNBA, I mean, let's just talk about them for just a brief second. Um, <laughs> It's hard. One, first of all, 75%, if not 90% of the WBA is women of color, black women at that. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell, um, how do you tell a, a group of women who are actively affected by this, who are literally the, the target, right? Black women that we can't talk about something that's our, you know, like how, how do you tell us to ignore this and play sport? Uh, like, nah, like we don't make enough money for that. Most of the women that play in the WNBA, they don't do that because they, they're trying to make money. Like, obviously, that it's a great way to feed my family. But most of us get our checks from overseas, right? So for us, we do this because we believe in women. We believe in what the WNBA stands for. We want this to be here when we have kids, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a second-generation WNBA player. Um, I want this opportunity to be the same when my daughter comes up and my niece comes up, you know? So, like, we do this because we believe in what we're doing. We believe in women. And, and that comes full full circle when you talk about social activism. Like, we can't, we're women in, in, in doing our, following our dreams. Most of us have, have a, at least a bachelor's degree. So for us, it isn't a choice as to why, as to why not, right? Like, you have to use this platform for something that's bigger than, than basketball. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let's talk a little bit about... Let's go back to your childhood. Um, I was very surprised to hear, you know, just your story. Um, I want to start with, you know, your dark time during your childhood. Are you ready to go a little deeper? <laughs> so uh, basically, one second. Okay, they shut up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I grew up in an abusive household. Uh, I hate saying that because people assume that like my parents are little demon people and they put me in a closet or something. But no, nah, like um, right. my parents just weren't equipped. They trusted people that they shouldn't have with me. And I, and, you know, like I grew up, I was sexually abused, neglected. Um, and that's something I dealt with um, my entire life. Uh, I tried to take my life three times before the age of 16. Um, and my battle with mental health and understanding what happened to me and coming to that full grips has kind of has basically became the reason I am the way I am um bro people don't care it's okay them. it's all right hey at home this. edition <laughs> it's all uh, good it's all good yeah, and so as I got older I kind of realized what was happening to me um and what happened to me and it became like basically my life purpose. Uh, when I was 19, 20, I figured out like, this is why none of my suicide attempts work. Like, this is why I'm here to be a voice to the silence um, and kind of provide what it looks like living with mental illness. Um, I'm bipolar uh, and show like what this looks like in a realistic picture um, to show what it looks like to be a survivor of sexual abuse, to talk about these things as, in many rooms as I can, because, you know, like I'm six, seven. Um, I've been taught my whole life. Uh, I have a big personality, a bubbly personality. You don't look at me and see a victim. That's not what you think. Um, so when people hear like, oh, that happened to her, it changes the conversation. Because we start, because realistically, like we all know somebody, but we don't know that because we don't have these conversations. We're scared to talk about these things, especially in the black community. So for me, like I, I, I live every day trying, I feel like I'm living on borrowed time. Like, you know, like I think, I, 
I would have been dead for 10 years had I succeeded my last chance. Um, like I literally just, my, my gun lift, because in California, once you are committed to a mental institution, you can't buy a gun for seven years, I think. So my gun lift just came up recently. Like, um, and so for me, like, I feel like I'm living on borrowed time. So I try to be who I needed when I was younger. And that means that I have to amplify voices that look like me and have the same experiences as me in every arena I can until I can't. I get it. I get it. That is so courageous of you. I commend you for just standing out and speaking your truth. Um, I know that at times people, like you said, it is not something in our, especially African-American community. Um, a lot of times they like pray to Jesus. Jesus will pray help you day. through. Pray it through. Day, man. I understand. I understand. You know, but I understand that we need Jesus too, but also sometimes we do need medicines. Also, we do need a psychiatrist. Also, we do. <laughs> Jesus made them too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, I again, I commend you your courage for standing up and saying this is what's going on with me, because a lot of times people don't know. They see you smile. They see your life. They see your lifestyle. They're like, oh, my gosh, if only I was hurt. And they have no idea the struggle that you may have went through just to get up this morning. So, again, all commending goes to you because I'm very proud of you for just standing Thank up and you so speaking much. your truth, you know? Thank you so much. Um, I, no. I think that, you know, like my goal is to create safe spaces, right? Like I share probably like 80% of my life or of my, what I've done, right? Um, mm -hmm. And everybody ain't able to do that. I get that. And I, I don't want everybody to do that, but I want them to feel comfortable sharing that, maybe that 2%, right? And, and being comfortable enough to create safe spaces around them, because a lot of the problem is just that we don't, we don't, we don't really connect with people. We're taught to go out and put on our big strong face. In reality, like we're all somewhere on the mental health spectrum, whether it be over here with mental illness or just going through a rough time. But we all have mental health. Like mm -hmm. it's something we all have to actively manage, whether we do it subconsciously or consciously. Um, so my goal is just definitely to get people to have that conversation and check in on themselves, especially right now, because like especially. This is of course of course i always say when it comes to mental illness or mental health i feel like like you said all of us to me i feel like all of us are on that line you know it takes one thing to kind of just take you over to that line whether it's a death whether your kid is murdered whether you know something horrendous and tragic could happen for us to like go yeah, all the way you know what I, mean? I break up with a lifetime partner you know like it isn't always um so extreme and when we see it in the media it's always right like, jumping off a bridge or I'm <laughs> there's never like that, that spectrum which is where most of us live in the in the gray area right so mm -hmm. you know like i think the more pictures of what look it looks like you know liz cambe damar de rose kevin love the more people that are willing to tell their stories and share their stories the more the common people the regular people can see themselves like in that because I think the hard part is if I if I like representation matters in every arena if I don't mm -hmm. see anybody that looks like me or or I can relate to I don't think it applies to me and I just kind of ignore the situation so the more people who share their stories the more comfortable people are with treating mental illness as it, or mental health just like it's your physical health or physical mm -hmm. illness it definitely will take a long time and make it easier to have these conversations in the future Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we talked about you writing a book, I believe, last time we spoke. <laughs> um, some people don't know that basketball is not, you know, your love, but your true love. What is your true love? Man, poetry, man. Yes. Talk Maybe. about that. I think everything has a purpose, right? So uh, poetry, I say poetry is air. Basketball is my love, right? Um, I can't live without poetry, but you mm. know. Basketball and broke my heart a couple times. <laughs> so would you say basketball is your sight chick and poetry is your main? Yeah, poetry is my soulmate. Uh -huh. It's my, my current, you know, like it's my love, you know, like, okay. I, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, like I started writing poetry when I was 12. Um, I used to think I was going to be the next Alicia Keys. Um, my whole family could sing. Uh, I grew up singing in the church, doing okay. plays, all that stuff, talent shows, and I used to write music. Um, and when I was in seventh grade in English, we learned about Tupac, but not his rapping about his poetry. And we learned about Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. And the combination of one knowing, I didn't even know what poetry was. Um, and then on the flip side of that, a young girl around my age having this impact decades after, right? 
um, that was crazy to me. So I, I started writing poetry and like from that moment on, I was over it. Like I was like, poetry is it. Um, and then as my life got kind of darker uh, during my preteen and teen years, it was kind of the only way I could communicate. Like I have a big voice now. I never had this voice growing up. Um, only time people really, I didn't come from a household where we sat down at dinner, how was your day? I, you know, right. we kind of were shit. <laughs> um, and so like the only time I could really kind of get attention was when I'd be like, yo, I wrote something. And everybody be like, oh, let me read it, let me hear it, you know? So that kind of became my way of venting and, and it kind of became like cathartic for me. Um, and to this day, that's what poetry is. Uh, and I got to put out a book in 2018, right after I got divorced. Um, and I've had enough poems, probably put out three, four books, but my marriage and everything I learned in that situation um, kind of felt like the only thing important enough to put out. Uh, <laughs> You know, I put together a book and I published it and it's like my little love child. <laughs> oh my gosh. And but you know, I guess that was kind of your way out. You know, that's kind of I guess your way to kind of just get your feelings out and your emotions. Would you think poetry is what has kind of sustained you in that area of, you know, not going to the other side? You know what I mean? For sure. Uh like for the longest, like my poetry is very dark. Cause I, I was in a very dark place. Um, and then just finding community in poetry. Like my first time going to a, a slam poetry event or an open mic, I never heard anybody expressing the same feelings I was feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the Poetry Lounge in LA is a really big uh, venue. It's where She Han, Death, Death Poetry Dram, all of them are there. Um, and I used to sneak out cause it was, it started at like nine and it was on Tuesdays. I couldn't be out there late on school night and I used to sneak out. <laughs> when I was in high school. And um, I'd never been in a room where people were sharing, people that didn't look like me, didn't know me, didn't come from where I came from, were sharing these like kind of raw emotions and things that I connected to. And I'd never been in a room with people that could connect on sheer human experience. And I just really enjoyed that. So like the poetry community and everything that it, it promotes really was helpful for me. Um, and it's the reason I love like art and poetry for that reason is just it's a, it's a way to connect with people without kind of the the walls we always have up or, or the preconceived notions we always carry with us i get it i get it that that is amazing just to think you know that one thing poetry and you did this when you were a kid you know and now you're able to just project that not only doing basketball and you know college now college like how much time do you have left by the way for a school did you just you just started, started. right yeah, so I start on June 15th and I have two years. It's a two-year program, accelerated JD at Southwestern Law School in LA. Um, I, I'm not retiring. I definitely plan on playing when I'm done with my degree. Um, but I really didn't think we were going to have a season this year. And then I, I kind of just applied. Like, ooh, let's see. Um, and I only applied to this one school. And I was like, if I don't get in, cool, whatever. I'll go back to playing. And I'll apply to my whole list of schools in two, three years. Um, and I got in with a 50% scholarship. And I was like, you. <laughs> I guess this is the situation like this is what we're doing so um definitely a god thing um the school is actually very big in um advocacy work and in advocacy work and helping people so it's it's right up my alley um of course. I'm a social justice worker and work in that kind of field so Oh my gosh, I can't wait to see your future. I know it's going to be so extremely bright. Uh, during this dark time, I appreciate you coming out and chatting with me. But I definitely wanted to do a game with you, five for five. Um, answer five questions, five seconds. All right, all Are right. Are you I'm ready? ready. <laughs> describe one word to describe you. Goofy. Go <laughs> One word that does not describe you. Um, close minded. Oh, okay, I like that. I like that. Favorite color. Blue. Um, uh, person that inspires you most. Oh, right now, Sada Shakur, because I'm on my my revolutionary feels. <laughs> <laughs> Love it, love it, love it. Now, this is a very easy one. When it's all said and done at the end of the day, what will your legacy be? Oh, that's the easy one. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, one of my favorite quotes is Maya Angelou. You know, people will forget what you did, but never how you made them feel. Um, 
So I hope when, when I die or whatever the case may be, I hope that people realize that like I did everything. I gave more than I took, right? Like my goal is to make this world better. I'm still naive and young enough to think I can change the world. So I'm gonna try as long as I can. I love that. I love it. Money McGee Stafford. Thank you for chatting with me. Can I give you one bonus question or yes. just one bonus, I guess, last quote. Is there one thing that you can tell to everyone right now? Because we are really in a very <laughs> big movement, big situation. Um, what would you tell everyone? Is there something you could say to just the protesters? you know, everyone that's just sick and tired, what can you tell them right now? Man, um, we sick and tired of being sick and tired. I support everything and everyone. Um, and we got to get involved how we know how, right? So all I say is while we make noise, make sure we keep the attention and we mobilize behind that. So if that means reaching out to people in your neighborhood, calling your politicians, voting, 11 people, 11 states had their primaries today. Voting is so important, filling out the census. These things matter. Um, and, you know, we already lack representation in these areas, so we have to show up and show out. Um, but yeah, you know, like we are here. I feel everybody. I love my Black people. So proud of us. So, you know, that's all I got. I love it. I love it. That's so important. Thank you so much for giving those words of encouragement. And yes, you got to come back. I, uh, again, you and ATL, we got to chop it up sooner than later. For sure. Call me over for drinks or something. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Amani. I look forward to chatting with you soon. Be safe. Awesome. You as well. Thank you.